Well, hello and good morning to everybody uh, who has joined our very first online coach conference uh, at hockeytoday.cc. Our guest of honor, you can see him already next to me on the screen here, is the legendary coach from Australia, Rick Charlesworth, who's posing to be a Santa Claus at the moment, just like me growing his beard. <laughs> um, during our show, uh, you will have the, the ability to, to chat in the window uh, at uh, the right of your screen. Um, Rick will be doing his presentation. We will be monitoring on the side. We will be monitoring the chat window. So if you have any questions, we will deal with them at the end of the talk from Rick. Uh, from, and we will have a, a proper Q&A at uh, that moment. So uh, don't be shy. Start chatting in the right window if you uh, have questions for Rick. And uh, at the moment, uh, I think uh, I will give the floor to Rick and uh, let him go on with his uh, talk. Rick, the show is all yours. Thank you, uh, thank you very much, Ernst. This is a, an unusual experience for me. You, normally, you can react with the audience, and so uh, I do my best. It's a, it's experimental. Um, the 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 uh, topic which uh, we are going to talk about, I think, was uh, building uh, teams. And uh, I'm waiting, uh, Ernst, to see the, uh, the presentation. Uh, yeah. I think it will be on. Yeah, there we go. And uh, just a nice picture. In the end, I'm going to talk about, unashamedly, about uh, my experience uh, coaching national teams. Uh, which I did with the men and the women for 14 years. Uh, but I think the, the things that I'm going to talk about are just to uh, somebody who's coaching their uh, team, their club team, uh, their, their regional team, whatever, at what level it is. And so that's uh, some of the things that I talk about will, uh, will resonate uh, for people who are interested in coaching in general. Um, and we have one or two little advertisements. The first, of course, is a little advertisement for uh, my latest book. Uh, and uh, I can, uh, it's available on my website and uh, we need, needn't talk any more about, uh, about that. If you want to be successful as a coach, if you're looking to, uh, to build a successful team, then uh, my, the first thing I want to say is that you better have ambition and uh, ambition for your team um in the when i first started to play nobody uh, talked much about sports psychology but i remember reading in the in the 70s a book called psycho cybernetics in which maybe one of the first books on sports psychology but the central thesis of the book was we usually end up where we aim you better if you want to be successful you better have high ambition and uh i think uh, I, I, I think it's true to say that when I was coaching uh, at any level, um, my uh, aim was always to uh, build successful teams, teams that could win uh, the major competitions, teams that could uh, win the championship, finish at the top of the league, whatever may be uh, the, the, the task was. And uh, so uh, it's important that they have ambition. Uh, if you want to be a coach, um, Maybe these are some of the things that I think are important. When I was uh, coaching the women's team, I, I did a survey of the players after uh, maybe five or six years, and indeed these were the five things that they were looking for most in, the, in, in their coach at the time. They wanted somebody who was knowledgeable, who was on top of the detail, who did the work, who studied the other teams, who was on top of what was happening, what was new and fresh. Uh, they wanted a hard worker and somebody who was always uh, looking for something different, wanting to continue to learn. Um, they were keen to have a coach who would uh, would be listening and uh, flexible, and so they could uh, they could provide feedback. And indeed, I think it's important to understand that the the real innovators in hockey aren't necessarily coaches. I think it's the players, unless you have that sort of a uh, two-way relationship with your players then you miss out on ideas lots of good uh, messages that are important the players certainly wanted somebody who was consistent 
um, you know, whether you're rewarding or you're redirecting, uh, whether you're providing praise or you're, uh, you're um, delivering criticism, then uh, they, they look for consistency. And uh, more than anything else, I think number five there, they, they wanted to know what you thought. They, you, you make a mistake if you think you can trick them or you want to, uh, you want to uh, give messages that aren't uh, accurate. You better say what you think. You better uh, um, always uh, provide them with uh, your honest assessment of what's going on. Uh, they respected that. They might not always like it, but uh, if you're consistent and honest, then uh, you build a, a relationship on, on which you can uh, you can build things. <clears throat> um, for anybody who wants to coach, then uh, I think it's absolutely critical that uh, you uh, be yourself. You know, lots of us look at coaches in other sports and we look at coaches in our sport and we think they have uh, things that are desirable and good and uh, by all means you should be looking all the time to uh, uh, um, take ideas and, and uh, build your persona. But you have to really be yourself. And the other thing that's important is as a coach, you, you have to provide enthusiasm, you have to, you have to uh, lift the place. And it's important that you do that. Um, if you don't really know what you want, if you don't really stand for anything, you'll get found out. And so we should always be looking at our uh, approach to the game, how we want to play it, what things we think are important, and you better stand for those things. And uh, uh, that's uh, really, really important. But if you look at that second point that I have there, know what you want and stand up for it, uh, I say until, and the until is about yes, sometimes uh, things move on, you have to change. <laughs> uh, that What was a good idea 10 years ago, five years ago, two years ago isn't such a good idea now. And so uh, you better have the capacity to uh, adjust, grow, uh, evolve as a coach. Um, I think um, it... Um, the third point is uh, absolutely essential. You never, can never let uh, standards drop. You have to insist on quality all the time. If you start, start to take shortcuts, if you think that there's a way in which uh, you can do it that won't, uh, uh, that, that might be easier, then uh, guard against that. And of course, the last thing I think is uh, critical for anybody who's coaching anywhere, um, your, your responsibility is to create an environment which is a learning environment, but one in which the, the players are uh, interested, challenged, and having fun. And uh, I don't care whether you coach the national team or you coach the under tens, or the juniors, or the school team, whatever it is. Your you, your obligation and obligation as a coach is, is to create an environment they have fun. Uh, they will learn better. They'll come back do more. Uh, if you create that sort of environment. So I think uh, you know, those, those those sorts of things are absolutely necessary. Um, little piece here um, from, uh, um, I suppose, coaching, uh, coaching uh, theory, but uh, the coaching process, really, the, the acronym I use is GROW. It's not mine. It's, uh, it comes from... Uh, uh, so John Wilmot and, uh, and a whole range of others who have said it, but I think it's uh, it, it has value for you. Um, the coaching process is about really um, going through what are, what are we trying to achieve? What are our goals? Uh, what's the reality? What are we actually getting here? What's happening? Um, what options are available to us about uh, how we can change it? And uh, do we have the will and the wit to do the work to change it? And that's the coaching process, whether you're talking with individuals, you're looking globally at how your team plays, where you're looking uh, uh, at uh, what happens in your league. Um, and you spend your time uh, evaluating, uh, looking at uh, what, what's gone for, um, measuring uh, things, and uh, if you like, choosing options. Um, so I think it's important that uh, you all understand 
this is the process that we all go through, whatever, again, level that you might be coaching at. Some of the concepts that I think are important, certainly um, these sorts of things are all in coaching books, but uh, we, uh, we need to uh, talk about them a great deal. We need to have them in mind when we design training sessions, when we think about tactics, when we understand uh, skill development, all of the, the bits that go to, uh, to developing a coach. Um, first of all, of, of, uh, of uh, skill development is uh, specificity, you know. Uh, you better be doing um, what's, uh, what's required. You better develop the movements that are part of the game if you're going to uh, be successful in, uh, in uh, developing skills that, that you need. And uh, in ph physiology, if you want to develop new capacity, you have to uh, increase the load. You develop new capacity, you find yourself capable of doing more things. And uh, so those sorts of principles are important. The challenge point is interesting in skill development. It's the area at which you start to fail, which people probably can't reproduce the skill. And so the, it's necessary to keep pushing past that. And, uh, uh, and you need patience and persistence to do this. Uh, and, of course, uh, um, it, it's, uh, it, it's one of the more difficult things for any athlete. A lot of... A lot of what you do in coaching isn't about changing people. They change themselves, but you create an environment in which that occurs. Process versus outcome is first rule of sports psychology. You know, you uh, better focus on the process. Uh, if you get distracted by the outcome, uh, and that's when uh, you, you lose, lose focus as an individual or as a team. It's important that the coaching process involves lots of dialogue and questioning, reflection, is constantly important those sorts of things are critical and uh, in the end while well, when you're coaching young children there may not be uh, the same quality of the relationship as you get older and you're coaching adults then uh, certainly there's much more equality this becomes a partnership a mentoring environment rather than one in which you're, you're delivering uh, messages from above and uh, i suppose the last uh, concept I think is that for me skill is the technique plus pressure I want people who develop skills that are reproducible under pressure and in the end if your team is going to deliver on important matches in uh, on the bigger catches then your players have to be able to uh, uh, be able to do that so uh, these are just uh, if you like some of the, the the concepts that I think are important who's your team well number one of course is your players and then we talk about, you know, their capabilities, their flexibility, their strengths and weaknesses. All of those you have to assess. You have a, a staff of other coaches or maybe some people who assist you or maybe you just have a manager sometimes with the juniors. You have somebody who can help with strength and conditioning. In the national team, in a club, big club team or a, or a regional team, then you may have all of these people. You may have uh, the medical support, dietary support, uh, career and well-being. Seven probably is one of the things I think is important. I think the area where there's the most competitive advantage in sport in ways, that's in the area of human behavior. Mostly it's done. Uh, even in the most uh, professional sports, uh, I think uh, that's the case. All of us coaches see ourselves as amateur psychologists. But I think that uh, uh, someone who's a specialist in human behavior can offer invaluable insights to any coach. The other things I think uh, go without saying, but of course, um, number nine is really uh, important, has been for the last decades. When I first started playing, coaching was mainly occurring by anecdote. We didn't, uh, we didn't have regular videos of matches. We couldn't um, see what actually happened. And so a lot of uh, what happened in coaching was I thought this was what occurred and I thought that was what occurred and we never really had the reality in front of us. Now, video and the analysis, the capacity to count things and keep statistics is a critical part of being able to uh, manage a team. And unless you can measure things accurately, then uh, you're not likely to get objective results all the time. And that's, of course, what you are hopefully wanting to, uh, to have. And then finally, I thought I should say a little bit about the strategy and tactics. Um, 
it's pretty simple our game uh, you get the ball you try to keep it you get penetration and try and score and if you lose it and you don't score then uh, you've got to try and get it back again and start again and uh, so uh, I think that's what I think the second point is a uh, is something that people get don't necessarily get right there is a balance between possession and penetration and my view was always that uh, you have to get that balance right if you just possess the ball uh, and and you don't penetrate or threaten the other team then uh, pretty soon you're going to make a mistake something's going to happen and you'll be in trouble and so I would always say to my players that position pass doesn't have to be backwards and sideways a position pass actually be uh, uh, penetrating and uh, uh, get that balance is the critical part of uh, how you have to go about the game. Uh, of course, whenever you're building a new team and you're building a team that you want to be successful with, you better build a defence first. But always practice making goals. I don't think that any train. I don't, never had a training session where we uh, where we weren't trying to make goals. And indeed, for the players, this is the most interesting, challenging part of the game. And uh, you have to uh, you have to uh, be there. You have to be wanting to do that all the time. Being unpredictable is important. And the thing about being unpredictable that is difficult is, of course, you want to be unpredictable to the other team, but you want to be predictable to your own team. That only comes through lots of uh, work together, cooperation, understanding each other's game, each other's skills and abilities and what some person might do in any particular circumstance. So in the end, yeah, you're wanting to be unpredictable, but you're also wanting to be predictable to your own, to each other. In our game, getting the set plays right is uh, critical. It's a big part of the game. As the rules are structured at the moment, you better be good at that. And uh, if you have, you know, if you have deficiencies in that area, that's defending corners or taking corners or all of the, the starting points, you know, the outletting. Uh, when you win the ball from the side of the field or from the back of the field, um, when uh, you have a long corner, those situations, you better, you better spend time on that. That's important. Um, nothing, I think, is more important than a team-first mentality. You want players in your team who are willing to uh, play for one another and indeed uh, sometimes make their personal ambitions for the team. And... Uh, then I think the other thing that make, uh, makes uh, hockey interesting is, of course, you always uh, got to be willing to try things, you know, while always learning from what's happened in the past. So you're looking ahead and you're looking behind and you, uh, you better be doing that uh, uh, with whatever group of players you're, uh, you're, you're working with. Um, so... Here's, if you like, uh, the num building a team. You, if you want to be outstanding, if you want to build a team that uh, that you think can be uh, uh, successful, can can win the championship, the league, uh, the medal, then uh, I think there's four things you've got to do. You've got to be smart, healthy, diligent, and skilled. And I'll just talk a little bit about those things. I'm going to talk mainly about healthy. And healthy isn't about fitness or, or yeah, good health. It's about the culture of your organization, the way you interact with one another, the, the, the relationships that you have and uh, your capacity to learn and grow to together and uh, to connect with one another. Um, but I think those are the, they're the things that uh, I, would, I would focus on. Um, nobody uh, probably in Europe would know who these people are in this slide. Um, but the question on the left-hand side there, what might seem impossible and unlikely would make a big difference if we did it, is something that I think you have to ask yourself in your program uh, on a regular basis. And, and uh, you have to always be searching for innovation and uh, things that uh, maybe seem impossible, but you could succeed. The two guys in the slide, the guy on the right in the slide is a fellow called Barry Marshall. I went through medical school with Barry Marshall. And uh, Barry Marshall and Robin Warren, the guy in front of the microscope, came up with the idea in 1980 when I was uh, working in the hospital with Barry that uh, ulcers were caused by bacteria. The bacteria 
weak in the stomach wall and allowed the air to penetrate. Nobody in uh, medicine believed that was possible. The bacteria couldn't live in the stomach. The pH of the stomach was two. Nobody thought that this was right. Um, and uh, indeed, the drug companies wanted you, if you had an ulcer, to take medication every day of your life for as long as you live. Barry Marshall and Robin Warren identified the bacteria. They wrote medical papers. They were published in the journals. Their, uh, their uh, scientific method was uh, established as being valid, but nobody believed them. And uh, for 25 years, they uh, pushed this uh, case. In 2006, they won the Nobel Prize in medicine because they were right and everybody else was wrong. And uh, if you get an ulcer now, they give you a course of antibiotics and you're cured in a week. Uh, doctors who used to operate on uh, gastric ulcers now are without a job. <laughs> the, the, the thing doesn't exist anymore. And uh, so uh, it was, a, it, if you like, it was a, a historic um, invention or, uh, you know, concept. Um, and I think that the same thing applies, uh, not, of course, with the same impact, but in our sport or in things that we do. Certainly, I think that, uh, um, for instance, we went to the Atlanta Olympics in 1996. Atlanta was very hot and very humid, and everybody said, you have to play slow in this environment. You can't play a high-tempo game. Um, we went there to play a high-tempo game. But there were two changes in the – there was a change in the rule that allowed us to do that was the interchange. Most of the other teams didn't embrace the interchange. We interchanged 70, 80 times a game. And uh, we also uh, invented those little ice vests that people wear now in hot weather. Our players wore them before the game, when they came off, half time, um, whenever they were off the field. And uh, indeed, uh, we played a high tempo game in an environment where nobody else thought it was possible. In the end, we won the gold medal and we scored 70% of our goals in the second half because the other teams weren't able to play at the same tempo. It was a counterintuitive idea, but I think you have to uh, think of these sorts of things. I think uh, increasingly, as I said, statistics and analysis are critical. The numbers are important. This slide shows the halftime score um, in the World Cup in 2010 and in 2014. And you can see there's only one goal of difference. Australia is leading 1-0. We've had 13 penetrations to four against Germany in the game. Uh, th two goals to one, but it's 17 penetrations to three. And uh, in the end, just like in business, you have to make the numbers to get the numbers. And uh, so uh, my my thesis would be, yeah, the numbers are important. There's all sorts of ways you can measure. You have to find uh, what works, but this is uh, just, if you like, a simple uh, uh, example of that. So that's, if you like, the smart stuff, you know. Um, but smarts about strategy and tactics, analysis, sports science, all of those things which you have to do, which are important, and which, depending on your capacity in any particular sport, may be different. But important. Um, it's about things, continuous coaching a listening learning culture, you know, which goes both ways, players and coaching, staff, um, excellent teamwork and fine communication and relationships. And in particular, the thing that's really important is candor. And I'll talk a little bit about uh, candor uh, later. But I think that uh, that's a very important uh, uh, thing. Now, I think now, Ernst, we are going to show uh, a video. Little touch to play in Orchard. Kavanagh. Swan now. Steven stepped up into that right pocket. Swan spotted a gap. Goes on the tomahawk. And there's the cross in. Orchard's going to have a chance here outside the post. Oh, open goal. And they score. Kieran Govers scores. But automatically, the Belgian team have run away to Ragu Prasad to ask for the video referral. I'll go from your foot. Your foot. All right, thanks, Kieran. Well, Kieran Govers has just admitted that he kicked it. What an unbelievable bit of sportsmanship. 
he stuck his hand and said, you know what, I kick this, before it goes into the, into the D, it's come off a body, he's already said, before it goes in, that there's a foot. That's exceptional sportsmanship at this level of competition. Okay, Rick, we've lost you on the camera. Are you still there? Um, well, people, I think we've lost the connection with Rick for a moment here. Um, let's give him a little bit of time to uh, get back into uh, into his presentation here. I'm sorry for the technical difficulties. Um, obviously, his internet connection is not the best at the moment. Rick, if you can hear me, maybe it's a good thing to log out and log in again. Okay, uh, bear with us people. Rick has left his connection and hopefully we'll get back into the show uh, in just a couple of seconds. This is what you get if you try new stuff then sometimes uh, things go wrong and we have to deal with it. <laughs> I'm sure as coaches you can all relate to this. Hello? Hello, Ernst? Now you can hear me, sorry. I had my, my, yeah. my mic yeah. muted here. So this is, I was just telling the guys, this is what happens if you're in, trying new stuff. Sometimes uh, <laughs> <laughs> you, you run into shit and uh, as a coach, you have to deal with this. <laughs> we, we can all relate to this, uh, I think. But uh, we saw the video. Um, I don't know what, what moment where your uh, connection uh, lost. So we just saw the video, and I uh, propose that we just go back to the slideshow at uh, at this time. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I'll just make a comment about that. Um, okay. Yeah. Go ahead. Because uh, um, in the end, the, the 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 slideshow. Yeah. The the, the purpose of the video. Um, Lots of people would say, well, why would you do this? Um, my philosophy was that uh, we never take a shortcut. And uh, by claiming something we didn't earn, we, we take shortcuts. We set a standard for ourselves, which isn't as high as I want it to be. And so uh, the utility in having that approach was, uh, and indeed we, uh, we used to discuss this a lot in our team, the, the, the view was that we never, never cheat. And uh, by doing so, we set a standard for ourselves which uh, stretched us uh, and uh, didn't allow anybody to uh, take a shortcut. I think it's, uh, it, it's uh, there's all sorts of ways in which you develop your culture and uh, you th things that you think are important. Not everybody in our team, I would think, uh, agreed, but certainly the majority of them did. But we go on to the next slide, and and uh, just a, a little uh, quote here. 
coaching for me is about comforting the troubled and troubling the comfortable. And there are players in your team who uh, who are ahead of themselves and overconfident, and there are players in your team who need support and uh, assistance. And so, as a coach, you find yourself uh, uh, in both the situations. Uh, I think it's uh, important. Essentially, when you're coaching, you're rewarding, you're redirecting, and you're reprimanding. They're the three things that you're uh, constantly doing with your players. And uh, <clears throat> if you uh, if, the relationships you develop allow you to do that to different uh, different degrees. And then we had uh, the video slide. Then a little piece. This is comes from a business book because if you're uh, if you're wanting to develop uh, the right culture in your group, um, this little quote I think is not a bad description of what happens in a team. Cultural change gets real when your aim is execution. You need to change people's behaviour so they produce results. It's what we're always wanting to do as coaches. You discuss how you get these results as a key element of the coaching process, and we've already talked about the coaching process, the grow thing, you know. Then you reward people for producing results. If they come up short, you provide additional coaching. You withdraw rewards, you give them other jobs, or you let them go. And now, when you do these things, you create a culture of getting things done. And I think while that's a little description from a business book, it's a pretty good uh, uh, thumbnail sketch for what uh, might be involved in uh, uh, coaching with your team and the environment in which you work. So we're, you know, if we're not producing the results, we keep working at it, we practice it more. We try other things, we move people around, we maybe try different tactics, whatever. And so sooner or later, likewise, someone's not able to do it, then uh, we have to find uh, someone else who can. And uh, that's, uh, that's the process that we spend our, times, our time in. Another little piece of advice from business, this comes from Heifetz and Laurie. This is a piece from the Harvard Business School. Followers want comfort, stability, and solutions from their leaders, but that's babysitting. Real leaders ask hard questions and knock people out of their comfort zones and then manage the resulting distress. And again, what's the level at which your team's going to play? It depends on what competition you're in or whatever else. But I make, make no stand. If you want to be special, then it's hard and difficult. And... Uh, you uh, have to uh, take people to a place where maybe they didn't think they could be. I uh, spent 14 years coaching the national teams in Australia. And in that time, I never met a player yet who knew how good they could be. And my job was to lift the bar, extend them, take them to a place where they didn't think they, uh, they perhaps could go. And and uh, that was the the great one of the great challenges of coaching. If you're going to have a successful program and a successful team, then you absolutely need this. This is a famous photo from soccer, of course. We all remember Zinedine Zidane headbutting the uh, Italian player in 2006. Probably might have cost France the title because of course he was then not able to take penalty at the end of the game. And uh, um, Spain was, uh, uh, um, France was disadvantaged. But anyway, um, this is a quote from Zinedine Zidane about Real Madrid in 2006. Real Madrid, of course, is one of the richest clubs in the world, with the highly paid players. But this is, problem this season was that there were too many strong personalities in the dressing room. We didn't communicate properly because we were too afraid of upsetting one another. And in 2006, Real Madrid finished 27 points off the top of the league. So it was a pretty appalling season for them, given the caliber of their team. And my, uh, my uh, spin on this quote is that there were no strong personalities in the dressing room. Because if there were strong personalities in the dressing room, then they would have addressed the problems they were having that season and they were playing poorly. And indeed, um, this is what happens in tech. This is what happens in families and in businesses. People do not say what they think. And if you have that environment, then it's very difficult to find out what's actually happening. We're afraid of conflict. 
we avoid conflict, we run away from it, we don't want to, uh, we don't want to challenge sometimes. You have to be able to say what you think. And if you're going to be an effective team, if you're going to be a successful team, then you have to have difficult conversations with people who are in the team. And uh, usually we run away from difficult conversations. You know, the normal response, if we don't like the criticism we're getting or we don't like the message that we're hearing as we of either fight or flight, we, we argue or we run away. Neither of those things are useful. You have to be able to embed yourselves in uh, crucial conversations. And if you're the coach, you have to become somebody who the players believe has the best interests at heart and who they respect for their for your opinions and for your uh, knowledge. And uh, if you don't have candor in your organisation, or your family or even in uh, your business, then you're not going to be as successful as you can be. You may, you may well be okay, but I'm talking about if you want to be outstanding, then you better have an environment in which people are able to say what they think, ideas are able to be challenged, and, uh, and we can progress from there. And in which people uh, connect with each other in a real and honest way. And these are the sort of conversations sometimes you have to have. Actually, things that when you do that, it hurts our team. What might you do to change that? What do you think is your greatest weakness? How does this impact on the team? What's stopping you doing something serious about it? You're not living up to the expectations of your teammates. You know, the ease, it's easy to give uh, the good messages. Oh, you're playing well, that's good. We, you know, and, and you need, of course, to, to uh, reward uh, those that are doing well, but you will have to have these sorts of conversations if you're going to maximize the value you're getting from the people in your in your team. And uh, surely we run away from these conversations. You better be able to stand your ground and be there for them. <clears throat> I think this one is uh, easy. Um, the photograph there is me when I was very young, uh, when I was a medical student, but I, I learned one of the most important lessons I learned for coaching came from that time. We had an old surgeon who was teaching us and he used to ask us at the beginning of each week, what's the price of life? And we didn't know the answer for the first couple of weeks, but we learned the price of life. Mr. Pestle, his name was Mr. Pestle, is eternal vigilance. And he wanted us to become capable surgeons. He wanted us to be diligent, spend time in the anatomy room. He wanted us to spend time assisting in operations. And what he was trying to build was a group of uh, students who uh, who were diligent and paid attention to the details, and uh, that's what you want in a in a surgeon. I think from my time in coaching, usually in the end, when things go wrong, it's because we get simple things that we ought to have got right wrong, or we uh, aren't able to deliver you know the basics as well as we could, and uh, so. The time and effort and energy that is spent in drilling and and uh, um, perfecting our skill uh, and uh, building, if you like, our resilience for when things go wrong is uh, is critical. So these are the things that are important uh, in terms of diligence. And of course, it's only through quality training and quality of your training is critical that you uh, develop uh, those skills. For me, training has to be harder than the game. So, you know, lots of game-like situations, lots of situations in which you've got less time and space in the game or you're outnumbered or which are more difficult than the game. Um, because if you put people in that decision-laden environment, in that environment where it's very complex and difficult, then in a match, they're maybe going to find their way out of it. They're going to find a solution. And so training uh, is a critical part of that. If you don't, if you don't have quality training, then I think if anybody to a good, uh, successful team. Um, <clears throat> Covers. Oh! Can you believe that, that goal? That is, is the most brilliant goal you may ever see. The overhead 
from Knowles has been tapped in by Gubbers right on half time. At the front and end of the half, Australia show its brilliance like only the Kookaburras can. I'm yeah. Here we go. Let me open up You're the still presentation. Here? Yeah, yeah, let me open up the presentation for you. Sorry. <laughs> the story of the video is an interesting one. Next, here we go. Yeah. The story of the video is uh, interesting for me, and maybe it's uh, interesting for you. Um. During the tournament uh, in The Hague, the World Cup in The Hague, we played a game against Spain. And uh, just before halftime, leading to, and and um, we played the ball at the back of the pitch for 45 seconds and didn't cross the halfway line. And I was angry with the team uh, at halftime. And after the game, I made the point that uh, um, really... There's a, we have control of the ball. There's a short period of time to go. We, we, we really need to get some penetration and make an opportunity to score at the other end of the field. And uh, that ought to be always what we're looking to do. And uh, I, I never believe, yeah, maybe there's only a, a few seconds to go in the game and you play safe to keep the game safe, then of course. But this was just before half time. So... Uh, um, I, I made the point very strongly. In the next game we played against Great Britain, you saw what just happened with eight seconds to go. Knowles threw a ball over the top and uh, uh, Gover scored an extraordinary goal, really uh, a pretty special goal. But the, the message from me was that uh, here we have the, some of the best players in the world, in the biggest competition in the world, and I think that, that they get lazy or they they uh, yeah, they don't don't appreciate what's possible. They're not pushing as hard as they could. And so uh, it was, a, if, if you, for me, like it was a real example of during the tournament, uh, adjusting something, making sure that we didn't make that mistake again. And of course, it doesn't always happen like this, but in the next game, a special goal was scored. Skilled, we understand, I think, what this is about. Um, and, you know, it's lots of practice, lots of good feedback lots of repetition, then continually doing things we couldn't do before, stretching ourselves, not, not just practicing the same thing over again, but making it more difficult, trying to do it faster with more competition, whatever it might be, and then being able to do it in competition. And that's the progression and the important progression that's part of uh, building skill. So those four things that I spoke about, you're going to be smart, healthy, diligent and skilled uh, you like I've covered them I just th thought then there's maybe a few other things I would talk about when I was coaching the hockey ruse um, before we went to uh, Sydney our team had been successful for a number of years and uh, we were ranked number one and there was a big expectation and one of the one of the mantras that we had leading into that last year was that we wanted to avoid tragedy uh, and tragedy was an acronym that stood for these things, you know, terminal players. Those are players who were just hanging on, uh, wanting to be there, not necessarily for the right reasons, weren't pushing themselves as hard as they might. Um, we wanted to avoid recycling. That's just necessarily doing what we'd done before because it was successful before. We wanted to stress and push for new things. Acceptance was something that leaks into the team slowly. That was like, oh, it's someone else's turn. We've been successful for a long time now. It's someone else's turn. And my approach was, well, no, it's no one's turn to win at the Olympics. You better earn it. And uh, so uh, pushing that way, we wanted to avoid groupthink. This was the G of the uh, of the acronym. Um, and uh, this is the, that, well, you know, whatever the group thinks. Is, you know, we want to challenge that sometimes. Sometimes the group gets it wrong. I'm happy for an individual to put up their hand and say, no, I don't agree with that. We, maybe there's another way. 
expectation is, yeah, it'll be okay on the day. You know, if we cut a few corners, it won't matter because when it comes to the day, it'll be all right. That's a fatal mistake. You have to always avoid that. Um, everything, you know, even the best player in the world. I remember seeing Roger Federer before the Australian Open 10 years ago, expressing his doubt about whether he had prepared enough. The best athletes, the best teams have doubts. You've got to be able to live those. And the why in tragedy was for, yes, this is, you know, immediately agreeing with everything that came along. You know, it's easy to do. Yes, we'll do that. Yeah, that's okay. That sounds all right. You know, you better challenge your opinions and your views and your ideas and your tactics. You know, you better continuously think, uh, is this the best thing? Is there a better way? And uh, so it was an important thing for us leading into that tournament. And I think it's those, those when you're, when you're building a team over a period of time for a big tournament, as you do in our sport for, say, the Olympics, or even in say, the European Championships, or even for a club that's trying to build itself up, then you, it's an evolutionary process, and you have to be aware of that. And uh, just a final slide here. That, um, I coached hockey rooms for eight years, and... This was produced by a psychologist who was working with the team. And it's, it's a description, if you like, as you go from left to right of the evolution of the team and the evolution of me as a coach. As you can see, after Barcelona, when I took over, the program was coaching, hierarchical discipline. Before Atlanta, increasingly, we were asking for athlete contribution then athlete participation. By the time we got to Sydney, athlete driven, you know, and so the the coach goes from being, uh, if you like, hierarchical on the left to a resource and mentor um, through a collegial process to get to the right hand side of the graph. And likewise, uh, from discipline to self-determination, from a doing culture to a seeking culture, that's the evolution that occurred over eight years with that team. And I think that uh, if you want to sustainably coach a group or a club or a team, then uh, you better you better understand that this is an evolutionary process, and it, you evolve, and the team evolves, and the coach uh, needs to evolve with them. And then the final uh, slide, I think, is just a little bit more of an advertisement. Uh, some of my other books that are, of course, available: um, the Coach is the Hockey Roos Tale. The Business Primer, which is uh, staying at the top. And, of course, uh, Shakespeare, the coach, is uh, the psychology of sport. You know, Shakespeare was our first psychologist in English literature. So we think uh, he uh, he talked a lot about why people succeed and fail. And many of those messages, 400 years old as they may be, are as relevant today as they were in his time. So 49 minutes I make it to Ernst. Um, yeah, perfect timing, Rick. Uh, this is uh, it's been a very interesting uh, chat with you, uh, and and uh, I think we we've got some questions in in our uh, in our chat window. So uh, we've got a couple of minutes left for a uh, final Q and A at uh, the end of uh, of your talk here. Uh, let me get you to the first question we got. Uh, let me just quickly look it up here for you. Uh, first question came from Don. And he asked, in an environment where everyone is desperate to be selected, how did you discern when players were being honest with you? Example given, yes, I'm fit to play, or everything is okay at home? Well, everybody's desperate to be selected, yeah. And when you're coaching the national team, I think that uh, um, in my book, The Coach, I talked about the criteria for selection. And uh, there are a whole range of things that we looked at. Uh, but number one for me is current form, you know. <laughs> Not past form, but current form, you know. How's this person playing at the moment? Are they confident what's, what's happening at the moment? Um, and then you have to look at other things like the balance of the team. Do they have any special skills? Um, uh, how are we going to play? What? What do they uh, perhaps offer us? There's a range of things like that. Um, I'm I I want everybody to want to play, but uh, in the end, um, then you have to also make some judgments about their fitness. So you might have to ask uh, ex 
someone external uh, in respect of uh, injuries, those sorts of things. But I think that uh, you know, for me, um, current form. Now, how do you measure that? And this is a subjective thing. It's the art of coaching. But I... I think it is important that you don't necessarily uh, you seek others' opinions because all of us have biases, and uh, it's important that you uh, that you seek other opinions. I can tell you a story about uh, uh, selection in uh, 1994 international championships, and I was looking for players for our team as I always was, and I saw a young girl from Victoria. I spoke to the selectors and they said, oh, she's not good enough. She used to be the team before you the coach. And I, I watched again and I spoke to this girl and she said, yeah, I was in the team for two years. I've been overseas with the national team five times. I've played 11 minutes. And uh, I don't know how you decide if anyone's any good after 11 minutes. In the end, we selected this girl and she played in our team. She got an injury a year or two later, so she only had a short career. But her last game for Australia was the... Olympic final. She's a gold medalist. And she was someone who someone told me wasn't good enough, you know. So I think you need to uh, you need to seek other opinions. You need to understand that there are biases out there. You have them. Other people have them, and uh, yeah, that yeah. that helps you make a better decision. Okay. Uh, I, I hope your answer is not going to be as long for every every question, but I, can, but I think you got. Sorry. I apologize. <laughs> No, no problem, Rick. Uh, you're passionate about about your your business as as we are. So, and then we start talking, and we don't stop. Huh? That's 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 always the case with us. Yeah. Um, we have we have a couple of questions from Jerome. Um, the first one he asked is, how did you encourage uh, cooperation and communication between national, state, regional, and local coaches when you were heading up the national programs in Australia, so that everyone was head, heading in the same direction. Well, we, we made sure that the co that each player had a provenance who had coached them all the way through. And whenever we were playing in a competition, then uh, they had needed to recognize those coaches and, uh, and we recognized them um, by, uh, you know, writing them letters, by uh, whenever we were in the area speaking about what they had done, how important it was. And so... You have to understand that by the time they get to your team, they've gone through a lot of other coaches. You better recognize those coaches. You try to develop relationships with them. You ask them uh, their opinion. You involve them in the process. Makes sense. Makes sense. Another question from Jerome. is a uh, sensitive amount, maybe. How long do you believe you, you have as a coach with a group of players before that starts, before they start to stop listening and it becomes time to move on as a coach? Uh, it's hard to say exactly. I, I think it's six to eight years, you know, maximum, maximum, you know, sometimes much less than that. It depends on how you're going. But uh, I was successful. I lasted for eight, but I didn't, I wasn't there all the time. You know, you need other voices. True. You need other voices, True. but I think maximum six. And and yeah. maybe a little bit related to that, also a question from Jason here is, uh, have you ever thought that, uh, okay, guys, I'm out. Uh, and if so, what kept you going for all those years? Yeah, well, I, you, you have to, uh, I mean, I, I love doing it. I, 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 I never thought I would become a coach. I became a coach by accident in some way, but I thought it's, I, I will try this. And I found myself in a job where I was working with a group of players who were very talented, hardworking, and wanted to be the best. Well, that was a great environment in which to work. So I was very lucky, um, but uh, it's about helping other people realize their potential. That's very satisfying. Work of a teacher is a very satisfying job. And and so uh, for me, I found it, it very rewarding. Uh, I was interested, I loved the game, the challenges of the game. So, so it wasn't difficult, but you, uh, you, uh, you need other voices, you need to refresh, you need to bounce ideas off people. Um, then you can last. Yeah, true, true, true. Uh, next question is is one that maybe relates also to uh, to our next uh, workshop uh, where we will have uh, Mark Cairns from Coach Logic, who is a former rugby international and who will be talking to us about video analysis and what we can learn for, in hockey from uh, a rugby way of doing the video analysis. 
But uh, the question came from Jerome to you, Rick, is do you believe a coach can learn and get ideas from other sports? Oh, yeah, I spent my time watching all, all of the other sports, you know. We have a game in Australia, which is more like hockey than any other. It's Australian football. No offside, unlimited interchange, play on from any situation, and at the pointy end where you score, it's crowded, you know. So tactically, even though it's a very different game, many of the things are the same. But I, I watch all sports. There's messages and lessons everywhere. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, another question from Jason is, what were the three best learning aspects during your career? Um, well, uh, the video was important. Um, as a player, we didn't have it so available, but it was important. Be and, and sometimes you only watch 30 seconds and you watch it really closely. You see so many things in there, every player, all the things that are happening off the ball. And I think, you know, what is happening when we don't have the ball is absolutely essential that you you give it time you know you have the ball two percent of the time the other 98 percent of the time what are you doing i think that uh, the human behavior thing you you need to speak to psychologists you need to understand what's going people to get your players connected with one another if they're not connected with one another in an appropriate way then you're not going to be successful so the psychology and the connection is important what's happening off the ball is important and uh, I think uh, from from my point of view, the other thing was that you be yourself, you know, and I was, uh, I'm a Carlos Rodegui, you know, <laughs> I, 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 I'm, I'm that sort of guy, you got to be that, if you're that, you know. No, true, true, true. Uh, last question for today, I think, uh, is from uh, Elliot, and he asked uh, Rick, how much input did you give to players in training content? And what you train during the the, the 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 training days, and how may you vary vary this for coaching younger athletes under 18s maybe? Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, we the national team. Then the players been through a lot of training, and they know a lot about training. There's lots of different coaches, so there's lots of ideas that come from them. And and we would ask them, what are you? What are what are some drills that we should do? What would you like to do? Sometimes we might not have agreed. We would modify it, but but we were always asking their opinions. Um, it is important that you make training, you give variety. You have to do different things. Sometimes they would have individual training where they were responsible for it themselves. Sometimes you have team training where, you know, you want to take responsibility. Sometimes the team tra training also takes getting fit at the same time as you're doing that. So that there, there, there's a lot of variety. There needs to be a lot of ideas from the players. When you get to the under 18s, Sometimes they're not so sophisticated, they don't know as much, but they still, there will be some of them who have have good ideas. Some of their coaches might have good ideas. Um, but you can always pick things from the international game too that you uh, put into it because they are, they watch that and they know about it. And, and uh, if you put it in that context, it's exciting for them. Okay, great. I think that, uh, guys, we have run our course here during this talk. We want to thank Rick uh, for his uh, time and for his uh, passion for the game. Uh, I think, I'm sure that uh, all of us enjoyed uh, watching you coach and uh, watching your teams play. Uh, myself, I was not so happy with you at the World Cup in uh, 2014, but that's another matter. Uh, anyway, uh, thank you a lot for, for, for what you gave to the game and for, uh, for your uh, talk to us today here. You uh, were the first in a first ever online coach conference. I think we got off to a good start. And uh, guys, we are open for uh, all of your feedback afterwards. But uh, we have to close up for, uh, for this talk here. Uh, and get ready for our next uh, workshop, uh, who will be hosted by Mark Cairns from Coach Logic. And uh, like I said earlier, we'll be talking about video analysis, the, the rugby way. So, Rick, thank you very much. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it as well. And, uh, yeah, and uh, thank you. I'm, I'm, I'm sure that we'll, we'll talk again soon. It was a challenge. I, I'm sure okay. it's, it's it's difficult talking to a, an audience that you can't see. Huh? Yeah, that's that's the difficult thing. But uh, maybe, yeah, and if if anybody is uh, 
uh, is has some questions and i'm happy for them to uh, send you have my details of course perfect i have your yes. details so if, they, if there are some interesting questions rising up from this talk then uh, we'll be sure to forward to them and get back to them in uh, on a later stage and uh, maybe if you guys watched our website we will be launching a new service uh, in 2018 that we call the coach chat service where we'll be we'll doing a coach uh, session like this but a one-on-one -on -one with one of the top coaches in the world and we'll make sure that we'll invite you once more for for one of these sessions uh, rick because it has been a very uh, inspirational talk so uh, thank you very much thank you thank you very okay. much guys uh, bye -bye. i'm closing off here and uh, i'll be meeting uh, the hopefully most of you in uh, in the next session as well rick thanks very much bye bye see you later bye bye